Hello, everybody. My name is Ana Rocio Alvarez, and I am going to host this panel with Rick Emerson, who is a podcast host. Oh, a longtime radio and television broadcaster. So sorry. And he's the author of the new book, Unmasking Alice, LSD, Satanic Panic, and the Imposter Behind the World's Most Notorious Diaries. And it's great to know that this panel was uh, and is sponsored by the Society of Professional Journalists New England chapter. So thank you for organizing this panel and thank you, Rick, for joining us. Um, and again, sorry for saying podcast. Right? I think I was thinking of a podcast. So that's Sorry absolutely that. fine. No, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start off very simple. So in your own words, what is Ask Alice about? So Unmasked Alice is the story of two social panics and the two books that help to you know, trigger or accelerate them. And then the person who was behind both of those books. So in 1971, a book called Go Ask Alice came out and it really changed uh, you know, the US in a lot, of, a lot of ways that still resonate today. So Go Ask Alice was presumably the posthumous diary of a teenage addict. It was the diary of this young girl who runs away from home. She gets pulled into drugs. She runs away from home. She, um, you know, uh, relapses. She gets clean. She relapses. She gets clean. And she finally dies at 17 and leaves behind this diary, which is then published anonymously as the book, Go Ask Alice. It came out in 1971, and it just said, a real diary by anonymous. And it was really a sensation. It sold something like 5 million copies eventually. It kind of created the modern young adult genre. And, and it also helped us solidify a lot of ideas about the just launched war on drugs, especially among older people and parents. So it had a huge impact. And then seven years later, a different diary did something kind of similar. A book called Jay's Journal came out. And Jay's Journal uh, was sort of a sibling book to go ask Alice. It was another supposedly posthumous teenage diary, this time of a teenage boy. And it was the story of a young man who gets pulled into witchcraft and black magic. He ends up dying, leaves behind this diary, which then is published as a book called Jay's Journal. And Jay's Journal helped to unleash or to certainly helped to uh, accelerate what we now call the satanic panic, which was this 15 year literal witch hunt that just sort of roared across America, just ruining lives left and right. And uh, that all happened in the 80s and 90s. And what I did not know, but eventually discovered, is that both of these books, both of these teenage diaries, Go Ask Alice and Jay's Journal, they both kind of came from the same place. They both came from the same strange place, which is this giant house with blood red walls on the outskirts of Provo, Utah. And so Unmask Alice is a way to untangle that whole story and lay out the reality of, of what happened. And there is a third book that Beatrice Sparks wrote. So why didn't you analyze this book within? Mm, so she had a, a fairly long career, uh, longer than a lot of people realize. Um, after in her words, editing, go ask Alice. Uh, she put out a book called Voices, which was sort of a, Voices was a similar premise. Go ask Alice was presumably the anonymous diary of a, you know, it was the posthumous diary of a teenage girl. Voices was presumably interviews with four different troubled teenagers. Uh, she followed that book up with Jay's journal. And then uh, starting in 1994, for, uh, for about the next decade, she was pretty prolific. She actually ended up putting out, um, I think, six more teenage diaries that were all kind of variations on the same theme. All of her subsequent books, they were very, uh, very similar. The reason I focused on uh, Go Ask Alice and Jay's Journal is that those are really, of the books she was responsible for, those are really the two most influential. I mean, Go Ask Alice in particular really did not only did it help to create the modern young adult genre, but it really, it casts a massive shadow over the culture. I mean, uh, you know, even people who have not read Go Ask Alice, even people who've never heard of Go Ask Alice have been impacted by it to some degree because it is so much a part of US culture in the sense that 
Uh, not just in the way people think about drugs and not just in the way that young adult books are written, but um, you know, things like uh, the notion of the notion of drug spiking, the notion of, of someone slipping LSD into, into your food or your drink when you're not looking. Go Ask Alice really crystallized that for a lot of people. That's where a lot of people got their idea of drug spiking. It, it was that book popularized that notion. Um, Jay's journal, on the other hand, Anybody who was, uh, you know, in the states during, you know, the 1980s and 1990s, and there's a lot of discussion about it again recently, lived through the satanic panic when there were, you know, there were a lot of prosecutions and, you know, a lot of people who went to went to prison sometimes for decades, um, who, you know, where those cases essentially sprang from this paranoid fear that Satanists were lurking all over the country. And both of those social panics um, trace to those two books, Go Ask Alice and Jay's Journal. So that's a long way of saying that those two books really made the biggest impact. And you're a radio host, you're a television host, broadcaster. So why write a book about these two diaries? And also why these two diaries? Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that I came of age, you know, I lived through both of those social panics that I mentioned, you know, the war on drugs that began in 71, uh, but it really, you know, it really kicked in in the 1980s, you know, during you know, once Ronald Reagan came into power, the war on drugs really just ratcheted up and became even more intense and even more destructive. And, and Go Ask Alice really helped to to form a lot of the opinions that made that war on drugs possible and that it helped to sustain it. And then in the 80s and 90s, as the satanic panic took hold, you know, I was a, I was a teenager at that time. And, you know, I remember, for example, uh, when I started high school, uh, you know, going to a lot of anti-drug lectures and a lot of anti-drug seminars, which were sort of a mix of they were a mix of uh, genuine information and, you know, and propaganda. You know, they were a mix of they were a mix of fact and and just fiction. Um, I, I remember, though, that by the time I was, you know, by the time I was a junior or a senior in high school, drugs were still considered a problem. But that had really that had really transitioned to this fear of the occult. And I, I remember at least one time when I was, and I went to a public school. I didn't go to a religious school. I went to a public high school. And I remember on at least one occasion, they brought in uh, you know, police and city officials during our social studies class who you know, took an entire, I think it was at least an hour where they talked about this threat of suburban Satanism and how there were you know, witchcraft cults and underground covens that were waiting to ensnare, you know, all of us, you know, young people, especially. And I, even at the time, I remember thinking, you know, well, this, this all just sounds, you know, this sounds a little crazy. And so having seen a lot of the impact of those panics close up, and then once I, be, you know, when, when I got older and realized that those two social panics, and that they both stemmed from, in part, these two books, and then when I discovered that nobody else had sort of told that story, that was the most surprising thing, is realizing that nobody else had really told the story. And, you know, and I, since nobody else had written the book, I realized that the only way I was going to be able to read the book is if I wrote it. So I ended up writing it. And so I'm going to go now into, you know, the book, since I'm pretty sure you're now an expert on. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read a little bit of how this book was, you know, presented. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the harrowing true story of a teenager's descent into the seductive world of drugs, a diary so honest you may think you know Alice or someone like her. Read her diary, enter her world. You'll never be able to forget Alice. Mm -hmm. Now, from this conversation, we've already established that Alice is not real, but who is Alice? Who is this 15 year old girl? Well, so that's, that has been the question for a long time that people have asked is, you know, is Alice real? Is this a true diary? And, and uh, it's certainly, it's worth noting that for the first, uh, easily the first decade uh, 
after Go Ask Alice was released. So that book came out, Go Ask Alice came out in September of 1971. And you go back and you read, and I talk about, uh, I present a lot of this in the book. If you go back and you look at the press coverage of Go Ask Alice when it was first released, um, and the overwhelming consensus, especially in the media, was that it was absolutely authentic, that it was an absolutely real diary, which to some degree is understandable because um, you know there was nothing on it that said it didn't say fiction. In fact, it didn't it didn't say fiction, but it also didn't say nonfiction. If you look at the original, uh, so the first editions of Go Ask Alice, if you look at a lot of the paperback editions of it, it doesn't say nonfiction, but it also doesn't say fiction. It's just presented to you, the reader, as Go Ask Alice, a real diary by Anonymous. And without any sort of fiction or nonfiction label, people were just left to their own devices to figure out, well, is this real or not? And so the, the consensus for a long time was, well, this absolutely uh, you know, must be real because how could they say that otherwise? They couldn't say a real diary if it wasn't. And over time, that perception shifted uh, to you know, by, I would say, 2000 or 2005, it was much more divided, um, you know, probably 50-50 or 60-40 in terms of people thinking, well, you know, this is just anti-drug propaganda. You know, this book is just was was just created from top to bottom as a way to, you know, as, as a scare tactic to keep kids off drugs. Um, and going into this, you know, I, project, I, I myself, I mean, when I first read it in high school, I absolutely believed that it was real for the same reason that you know a lot of people did it said a real diary um going into this project i think i I'd, I'd come around to the idea that well okay this is probably just fiction this is probably just made up from scratch there's probably probably never was an alice it's probably just entirely fictional um without giving away too much because it is sort of a fascinating story i will say that neither of those Neither of those assessments, the idea that it's entirely fiction and the idea that it's entirely true, neither of those things is fully accurate. Um, the truth sort of somewhere in the middle. And um, I, by the end of the book, I do lay out the reality of what happened. I give the backstory of, of the real events and how it came to be. And it, it was surprising, but it made a lot of sense. Um, but you know, for a long time, people did absolutely unquestionably think it was real and then that did split as far as alice herself the way she's presented in the book this is i think one of the reasons why go ask alice has had so much success over such a long period of time because you know that book go ask alice has been in print for more than 50 years now it's never been out of print um they just put out a 50th anniversary edition of it uh last year if you you go to some place, uh, you know, like Amazon or an online bookseller, and you look at the rankings. You'll see that Go Ask Alice continues to sell well. It continues to sell well not only to older people, but it sells well to teenagers. If you go on TikTok, you can see all kinds of people who are in high school right now who are reading Go Ask Alice, who discovered it on their own or from friends, and who really, uh, you know, really connect with it. And I think that's because, um, because the character of Alice, the way that she writes and the way that you know her diary is presented, she really does give a, I think it captures what it feels like to be a teenager. And it's been a long time since I was a teenager, to be clear. But um, you know, but I but if you read Go Ask Alice, it really does, it really does capture um, even though it's very dated in terms of its language and its cultural references. It really does capture that feeling when you're 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, that feeling of being caught between worlds where you still feel like a child sometimes, or you want the security of childhood, but you also want to be adult. You also want to be grown up. And, you know, there's also that, that thing that happens when you're a teenager, when you simultaneously feel like you're going crazy and that you're the only sane person on the planet. I mean, I remember thinking that when I was in high school, I would sometimes feel like I was going insane. And I would also feel like everybody around me is crazy. I'm the only one that knows what's happening. And so there's just all of these, this, all these combustible emotions that happen when you're a teenager. And, you know, the sense that your parents can't understand you, that they don't know what it's like when you, you know, to be young, that they, that they were never young and, you know, things are so much different and just all of this going on. And, and Go Ask Alice really, it really does, um, you know, convey that feeling so much so that, 
in some ways, you know, the drug taking aspect and the addiction aspect, not that it's unimportant, but it's almost not relevant. It's almost, it almost, in other words, it's, it's absolutely possible to read Go Ask Alice and to have no drug experience, to be clean and sober, and to not even really be tempted to take drugs, but still connect with that book just because it captures, you know, just that that really tumultuous period of, uh, you know, of life so well. That's one of the reasons it's held up for this long. So a few questions arise from what you've just told us. First of all, how long did you spend, you know, going through all pieces of press, reading the books, analyzing everything, you know, going back so you could, you know, do your book, write your book? <laughs> uh, far longer than I anticipated. I'll put it that way. Um, the, so I, so this is actually, uh, so I wrote a book before this. I wrote, uh, I co-wrote a book um, back in, or published a book back in 2011 with my friend Lisa Desjardins. And um, what I did not realize at the time was that, so that my first book, I, it went from idea to publication in, I mean, it was something like, something for like, ten, like two years or something, like less than that. I think 18 months actually it was, I went from idea to being sold to being published and I think it was at most two years, which at the time I did not realize was unusual. At the time I did not, I, I was, you know, I was like, well, this is, this is, this just must be how long it takes. I had no idea how lucky I got with that first book and how quickly it went. So this book I started in 2015. Now, admittedly, there's a COVID year in there, but even if you subtract the COVID year, um, you know, I started it in 2015 and I mean, literally my editor and I were doing last minute, you know, revisions and, and, and touch-ups to it as of April of this year. So, I mean, it took almost seven and a half years, which when I say it out loud, sounds even longer than it felt. So it was, it was a long process. I'll put it that way. <laughs> I can, now that you, I, I kind of figured when you were saying, yeah, when, going back to the, to, to when it was first published and going to the press and I was like, wow, this, must have taken a lot, but the other question that I had is, okay, so it's not described as nonfiction. It's not described as fiction, but it does say a real diary. Wouldn't the world, the word real pre-establish that it's nonfiction? I mean. It's what's well, hard to say because let's see, I've got, um, let me see if I can find this here. So I've got, um, I've got a whole bookshelf here that has I mean, I own more copies and more editions of Go Ask Alice than anyone needs. I've got, when this is all over, I, it's like I need to start some really absurdly specific bookstore that only sells copies of Go Ask Alice because I've just got like a dozen of them. So uh, so there's a copy of Go Ask Alice, for example. This is from 1983, I think, and oh, 1982. So it's a, it's, a, um, it's a paperback version of Go Ask Alice from 1982. It's from Avon Flair Books. And so this is actually one of my favorite examples because... You've got, so if you look on the inside, so on the inside on the copyright page, it says fiction. On the front, it says a real diary. And on the side, it says, you can't really see this, but on the side, it says autobiography. So this one copy of this book says a real diary and autobiography and fiction. That's all just on this one copy. And the, so when I when I mentioned that the first edition came out and it didn't, didn't had no sort of label whatsoever, it didn't say fiction or nonfiction. I mean, I don't want to say every single version is different, but I will say that I mean, every few years the way that they label Go Ask Alice in particular has changed, and it seems to change depending on you know the whim of you know the you know the of like the designer if they're doing a new cover or if it sort of gets absorbed into a new imprint. Um, you know, there's no consistency in how that book is labeled, which is sort of surprising. And a thing that I didn't really anticipate when I went into this project, I, something I did not realize is that, you know, it, I mean, it's weird because if you, you know, in, you know, in the United States where most, almost every product has to be labeled in a way that tells you exactly what's in it. I mean, if you go buy a can of soup, that can of soup has to tell you what's inside the can. Now, certainly there are bad actors and there are companies that, you know, ignore the rules and there are people, you know, sometimes things are, are deceptively labeled. But for the most part, you go buy something in the store, you look at the ingredients, it tells you what's in it. What I didn't really fully realize is that books are just a towering exception to this, that the publishing industry works on 
an honor system. And the thing about an honor system is that an honor system only governs people who don't need it. I mean, if you're just trusting people to do the right thing, the only people that that's going to be effective on are people who you can already trust. Uh, and you know, and I'm not saying that everybody in the publishing industry is doing this with nefarious intent, but it does it does raise a lot of questions. You know, that when you go see something that is labeled memoir or fiction or nonfiction, and you realize that those terms don't really have any legal meaning. They don't have any specific legal weight to them. They're just marketing handles, and they can mean whatever the publisher wants them to mean. And even now, you, it's, it's possible, I think, I can't swear to this, but I do believe, I think now the newest version, I think the latest version of Go Ask Alice um, as of like 2019, I think they're back, they were just back to not putting any label on it whatsoever. So it just had a real diary in the front. And if you didn't know any better, and if it doesn't say fiction, a lot of people are just going to assume that it's that it's absolutely genuine. And I'm, I'm, I don't know if you go into this book, uh, into this in the book, but did you ever contact, for example, the publisher? Because that is information that it, that's like in the, you, you just read it, you know, fiction and the information about the publication. Did you ever contact the publisher to see what they thought, you know, was this book? information about it? So I spoke to, uh, early on in the process, I spoke to uh, a woman named um, Catherine Fitzgerald, and Catherine Fitzgerald was the original editor at Prentice Hall uh, for Go Ask Alice, and she and I, we had a long interview, and she talked about, you know, the idea that when it first came out, it was, you know, what I call agnostic labeling, that they just, you know, and in fact, when, in fact, the, the first edition, the hardcover edition of Go Ask Alice that first came out didn't say a real diary. It actually just said, go ask Alice by anonymous. So it didn't say fiction, didn't say nonfiction, but it also didn't say a real diary. It just said, go ask Alice by anonymous. And that was that. And then when it came out in paperback uh, from, um, from Avon, uh, Avon added the subtitle, a real diary. And I know that um, Catherine Fitzgerald, who edited that book was, she was uncomfortable uh, with that. And that has the way that it's been labeled has fluctuated a lot since then. Um, it's currently with um, Simon and Schuster, and you know, honestly, you know, tagging anybody who currently works at Simon and Schuster with, you know, with the content of this book that came out 50 years ago, sort of fell outside, you know, the umbrella of what I was doing. Um, you know, they, the people who work there now, to the best of my knowledge, just sort of inherited the book, um, and the marketing of it has, you know, had been well established by then, but. It's interesting because it doesn't just, I mean, Go Ask Alice is a, is a particularly high profile example of this, but you don't have to look too far in publishing to find cases where, you know, books that are labeled um, fiction are actually nonfiction and vice versa. I mean, it, it definitely happens, you know, more often than I certainly expected. And going again, back into the book or more or less the impact the impact of Go Ask Alice, how long, did it, how long did it take for people to realize that Alice was real? Well, there was, even when it first came out, so when it came out in 71, as I said, the, the, over, the overwhelming consensus at that point was to treat it you know, as absolutely authentic. In some, to some degree, that was because in a weird way, it became a sort of a, a self-fulfilling thing uh, or self-perpetuating thing, I guess, in the sense that nobody, you know, nobody wanted to be seen uh, for the early reviewers. You know, nobody wanted to be, nobody wanted to seem like they were stomping on the on the writing of of this dead girl, you know, because if it turned out that she was real, nobody wanted nobody wanted to be the person who was writing this review, insulting the writing of this girl who lived and had this tragedy and died. And so I think there was this reflexive, there was sort of this built-in caution of like, well, we better. We better just be respectful and you know not push too hard because you know we don't want to look like we're beating up on this on this young this young dead girl who is not allowed or not around to defend herself. Um, there were cases early on where uh, you know a newspaper or a library would class it as fiction, um, you know, but those were those were really the exceptions. It seems you know so far as I can tell that seems to have increased essentially with every passing decade, uh, 
the skepticism or the split in that uh, increased. And it's like a lot of things, you know, that accelerated with the rise of the internet um, and, you know, with you know, people having access to, you know, copyright records and being able to research or, you know, or frankly, people just being able to write, you know, uh, the number of people by the time the internet emerged, people who had grown up reading Go Ask Alice were now authors themselves. And a lot of them were writing, you know, either books that were inspired by that, or they were writing columns or articles about it. And so there became a lot more public discussion about it. And, um, you know, and where people would have some of their skepticism, uh, you know, confirmed or, you know, or underscored. We got a question here from Adam. So there was there were a lot of people who were offended by the contents and tried to get it banned from libraries, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. It was well, it, and it is. I mean, it's been a while since I've looked at the American Library Association most banned and challenged list, but I know that for the first decade, that the ALA did their most banned challenge uh, challenge lists. Um, I, I mean, I think Alice was in the top. You know, I think it was in the top five for the first decade. And even now, I mean, it's, you know, one of the things about, one of the things about working on, about, on this book is how many things from, you know, the early seventies and the late seventies, and frankly, the eighties and nineties, how many things just keep coming back again and again, you know, it's almost like there is no present, there's just recycled past. And one of those things is the continual outrage, um, from various quarters about Go Ask Alice. Um, because, you know, and there's, because there's no way, I mean, which is understandable to some degree because, you know, especially given the fact that um, it was marketed to and certainly read by, you know, teenagers and and people younger than teenagers. I mean, it's, you know, it's a, it's a book. Yeah, I mean, it's not, you don't have to look too hard to find people who read Go Ask Alice when they were nine years old or 10 years old or 11 years old. In fact, I think I tell a story in here about, um, about a, uh, a lawmaker from Illinois who found, I believe she was nine, his, his, I believe it was his nine-year-old granddaughter reading Go Ask Alice. And, you know, and, and he opens it up and he's flipping through and there's this passage where she's giving kind of a graphic discussion about performing sexual favors in exchange for drugs. And he's like, my nine-year-old granddaughter's reading this? I don't think so. And so it was this combination of sexual content and, you know, and a lot of really a lot of really disturbing and unsettling and sometimes violent sexual content. And also just a lot of, just a lot of material that's really horrifying. I mean, there's a section, I mean, Go Ask Alice really, you know, it's one of the things about Go Ask Alice that continues to surprise me is how many people, people who either have never read it or have not read it since they were very young. So people maybe who haven't read it in 30 years, they remember it being, kind of campy or they remember it being sort of kitschy but the thing is if you go back and read go ask alice now i mean some of the language is dated and you know and some of again because it ostensibly took place in the late 60s early 70s so a lot of it you know does have that 60s flower power era sort of vibe to it especially in terms of the language but the content of go ask alice is it still really packs a punch it's a genuinely disturbing and horrifying book in some ways and you know, and, and was infinitely more so 50 years ago. Uh, so there, there were and are concerted efforts, um, you know, by parents groups, by religious groups, um, to get Alice taken out of schools, to get Alice taken out of libraries. I mean, it is, it has been a, a, a target for censors since the very beginning. And Katie, I'll go to your question now, but before that, I wanted to ask, do you think that there's people that still believe Go Ask Alice is a real diary you go on amazon right now and look at um you know just look at the the uh, the reader reviews of the reader you know um and responses on amazon um and i i saw this or this is another thing that i didn't know what to expect when i first started working on this but early on in the process when i was doing research i thought well i'll just go to amazon and see what the readers you know see what people think and there was, I don't want to say it was a 50-50 split, I, I can't say for sure, but it did seem like it was pretty even, uh, pretty evenly divided in terms of what people thought. And there, you know, I, I mean, I, I will tell you, you can, I mean, I was about to say, you can go on the internet and find people who, but of course, as we all know, you can go on the internet and find anything or people who, you know, anything you can think of, you can probably find on the internet for good and bad. But I will say that you don't have to look, you don't have to look too far to see evidence of that split where there are people who will 
you know, out of hand, just say, well, it's absolutely fiction. It's, you know, it's total nonsense. It's just completely fabricated. But you'll find people right now today who, you know, will say, you know, this book really happened. This story is real. This girl lived. This girl died. Her parents wanted her story to be told. Um, and there are people who are in the middle. They think, well, maybe this was, you know, real, but it's been embellished. Uh, but that, you know, that's still a real, that's still a real split. And, and again, you know, and I, I, a thing that I discovered was that, you know, the answer to whether it's absolutely real or absolutely false is, is not quite as clear as I thought it was going in. So even after all the investigation, the deep dive, you still don't know if it's real or not. Well, there is. I do. I do talk about this as the uh, toward the end of the book. That um, you know, one of the things I one of the things I always try to say is so it's like when you go see a movie and you know everybody's had this experience where you go to see some film and somebody's like, okay, well, whatever you do, don't Google it. Just just go. That you're better off if you go to the movie not knowing anything about it. And, and so when somebody tells me that. I tend to follow their advice. And there's some of that in this book, in Unmask Alice, that, that I, I sometimes tell people, you know, that um, it's hard not to know. I mean, A, it's hard not to know anything about, about this story. If you, you know, if you have any knowledge of Go Ask Alice whatsoever, people will come to it with their own beliefs and their own knowledge. Um, and also, obviously, anytime I'm talking about or doing an interview, it's, you know, I'm going to be talking about it by some, you know, there's, you know, there's certain stuff you just can't get away from. But I also, I also do try to leave a little bit of it, um, I, I try to leave a little bit of it, but uh, you know, just for discovery when people read the book, just because it's it's a better narrative experience. I will say that there is an answer uh, to that question, and by the end of the book, I do lay out what really happened. I don't want to, I don't want to be. Uh, I tried really hard to not write one of those books where. So I'm a big, I'm really, uh, I'm really fascinated by the by the story of D.B. Cooper, the 1971 hijacker. And, you know, to this day, they've never caught him. But, I, you know, every time there's a D.B. Cooper book or a documentary or a TV series, I sit down in front of the TV, even though in the back of my head, I know that it's like they're not going to say, like, we finally found him. I mean, just because I would already know about it. And so and yet and yet every time there's a D.B. Cooper documentary, I sit down and I watch it. I invest two hours and then I get to the end and I'm somehow surprised. And I go like, there's no answer. So this book is not that. There is an answer to this story, you know, to that question. And at the end of the book, I do get into it, um, and I lay out, you know, the backstory of what really happened. And it's, um, you know, it's it makes sense and it's a satisfying conclusion, but it is it is sort of surprising. And so, getting to Katie's question, she says, "Hello, I definitely see the resemblance between this and the 1973 book Civil." which possibly was also a, at least partially fabricated. Do you think more exposure of these task tactics will deter art, uh, authors from fabricating people or events to sell a book? So there's a great book about Sybil uh, by Debbie Nathan. Debbie Nathan, I think it's called Sybil Unmasked. Yeah, I think it's uh, possibly, I might be getting that title wrong. Um, but yeah, but yeah, so, yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so yeah, and that's, and Debbie Nathan, by the way, is, you know, she's uh, an amazing writer and has done incredible work in a lot of areas. And she's written about the satanic panic as well. Um, I, it's, I mean, it's tempting to think that, you know, that eventually this, this recurring problem of things being, you know, misrepresented or mislabeled, or I mean, in some ways, in some ways, it's almost it's almost more egregious to me when there's no label whatsoever, and the readers just left to sort of figure it out for themselves. Especially when you're talking about books that are, in many cases, such as with Goas Callas, that are, you know, that are now directed and marketed, you know, at young people. They are directed. I mean, they're you know, they're they're young adult books, and you know, it it's hard. I don't want to say that it's worse, but it it, it is deceptive in its own really insidious way to just put it out there saying a real diary and then to give no indication whatsoever. Um, I realize I've totally gotten off the point of answering the question, but I will say that I, I don't know. It would be nice to think that something would change, but you know, um, humans are great at not learning lessons. And so uh, it does seem like about every 18 months or two years, there's some, probably more often than that, there's some story about like this memoir turns out to not be a memoir. And I mean, I, I thought after the James Fry million little pieces thing, I think a lot of people were like, okay, this is really going to, this will never happen again. We've learned our lesson. But clearly, we have not learned our lesson. And that lesson might never be learned. I don't know. 
I hope that answered your question, Katie. <laughs> I saw her that was like, did it? Did it not? <laughs> um, so you talked about how much time it took, you know, seven years to <laughs> work on this book. So, but going back to, you know, how challenging was it aside from, you know, how many years it took, but how challenging was it to work and port and investigate about this book, given how much time it had passed since the book was published originally? Now, part of that was, and, and I, um, you know, and, and I should say that I, I mean, this gave me a whole new level of respect for and admiration for, you know, historians and, you know, and, you know, and special and, and writers in general, but also journalists who deal with anything that is in the distant past, because, you know, most of this book, not all of it, but the bulk of this book takes place, um, you know, in the 60s and, 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 you know, and forward, you know, so it's, it's, a, most of it is within the last 60 years. And, you know, where there's a pretty, a pretty deep written record and a pretty deep journalistic record to go to. I mean, you know, I mean, and, and also just because of the internet, you know, it's, you know, I, the idea, you know, it used to be, it was not that long ago, you had to just travel to a library or to a university to be pouring through newspapers and you had to hope that the periodical guide or the microfiche was still, you know, was, so I, you know, so it, it really was um, more than anything, it was the just the amount of material. I mean, that's its own kind of problem because when you start covering stories that exist in the in the mediated age, it just becomes, you know, where there's just this, this uh, you know, there's almost just this tyranny of choice where you just have so much media coverage to try to wade through. Um, you know, there's also a little bit of a ticking clock element in the sense that a lot of the people that I was writing about and hoping to interview were you know, some of them were, some of them had died, some of them, I, in the course of writing this book, I think three different people that I interviewed uh, died before the book was actually finished. Um, COVID might have contributed to that, but also just some of those people were already, you know, they were in their 70s or in their 80s. And um, uh, it, it really was, more than anything, I think it was just trying to tell the complete story without being exhaustive. You know, uh, you know, to make it to keep the narrative moving and to be complete without being overwhelming. It was it was really just about winnowing it down. So where did you where did you start with your deep dive in, you know, go ask Alice world? Mm. Uh, I think, you know, I, I probably started the way that a lot of people start anything now, which is that, you know, I, I came home and I, I thought, well, somebody must have written this book probably. And I, so I went online and I Googled and I realized that nobody had. And, and so then I just spent, I don't know, however, however many hours or days probably online, just sort of finding everything I could find on the internet about it, which, which turned out to not be a lot. That was actually a, a surprise early on. Uh, the idea that I, I was surprised at how little original, I won't say none, but they're just, I, I thought there would be more in-depth reporting on this that had been done and was available online and, and really wasn't the case. Um, you know, a four page article from 1979 was actually the most in-depth thing that we, when I started this book, that was still the deepest reporting that I was really able to find was this four page article from 1979. And there'd been another article about the same length in I think 2004 and everything else online was just kind of regurgitated pieces of those two articles. And so that's a long way of, again, a long, sorry, I tend to over answer things, but that's a long way of saying that once the internet, you know, once I kind of exhausted that, then I just had to go the analog route where I was, um, you know, calling old phone numbers that were usually disconnected and sending letters that came back undeliverable or, or uh, unopened. And, you know, and then, and fortunately, I did start this during COVID because then it was literally just going and knocking on doors and trying to find people. And then once I started to find, you know, a few people, then you can, you know, that builds on itself. And so then the story sort of builds from the outside in. And then, uh, then again, and, I'm, and again, I'm glad that I started this before COVID because then it was a long time of just being in dusty basements with boxes and boxes of old dusty papers that nobody had looked at for 35 years. So, and then it was sorting through thousands of pieces, pieces of paper, just trying to, you know, trying to, trying to get this together in some sort of uh, readable way. 
Didn't it get overwhelming at, you know, at times? Absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, there were moments where my office just looked like an explosion in a paper mill. I mean, it was just like things everywhere. And it's like playing the world's biggest game of concentration where you're just turning over pieces of paper and just hoping that you can find like, I think that went with something over in that corner that I turned over three days ago, hold on. And then no, and then trying to, um, and, you know, and also just, it's also a question of just knowing for me anyway of like how much is too much it's uh, you know if i'm trying to establish that you know for example early on when i try to establish the way that the press treated go ask alice in the early in the early days and how did they review it it's like well do i do i do i put three reviews or do i quote five reviews or seven and do i do i do i condense them or do do i do the whole thing and the another tricky thing about this story was that the timeline the timeline moves back and forth a little bit. In other words, the first part of the book essentially takes place, not entirely, but essentially takes place in the very early 70s and it moves forward. Then it goes back to that same period of time, but from a different perspective. So it tells one story and then jumps back and tells a parallel story in the same timeline. And it's a lot of it was just trying to figure out this sort of chronological um, you know, positioning for this, so the, where my editor really, really um, helped a lot to try to keep the reader, you know, so the reader always knew where they were, so they didn't get confused. And, you know, it just required what seems like hundreds and hundreds of terrible drafts. <laughs> it's like first and second and 50th drafts that were just unreadable and awful. I that's that's like when you have in your computer all your like first draft, first final draft, first first draft, second final draft, and and then you're naming all the different drafts until it's like the final 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 draft. It's it's like you're it's like you're looking at my computer right now because I literally have things (laughs) like seriously, this is absolutely the final draft. No fooling. I think that's the way of you telling yourself this is almost over. You can yeah. do this. <laughs> or just hoping. If you're like, maybe if I write it, maybe if I write yeah. final, it'll turn out to be true. <laughs> you, you were manifesting. You were manifesting the, yeah. the final yeah. draft. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Um, so we talked a lot about Alice, but we haven't talked about Beatrice Sparks. So who is she? So Beatrice Sparks is uh, the woman who, um, by her account, um, discovered and edited uh, several teenage diaries, most famously Go Ask Alice, um, for publication. She was a, a, um, uh, a very conservative uh, Latter-day Saint and mother of four, lived in Provo, Utah, and um, and she worked, uh, you know, she wrote over the course of her life, or she produced, um, I think, 10 different books, um, the majority of which, I think all but one of which is essentially a teenage diary. And her version of events was always that she would, um, you know, be cut. And sometimes she would, you know, with some of her books, she'd say, well, the parents contacted me after their son or daughter died or ran away from home or whatever, and gave me their diary so that I could share their story with other people. Um, you know, sometimes she would say that a book, you know, a diary came from a young person that she herself you know, met or had had counseled or had, you know, had, had worked with in some capacity. Um, and, uh, and so yes, yeah, so, but she go ask Alice is definitely the most, the most famous of those. But yeah, she, uh, she, um, yeah, put out nine of those books over over time. So when you say that she said, they gave me this book, and I edited it, was her voice embedded in the book somehow? without you know the in the real diary was her voice embedded in there or did she say this you know in another platform um uh when you say her real voice embedded in there do you mean uh uh, do you mean does she herself write in the book as herself or is it or or does the book or does the teenage author share her voice like how where did she say they gave me this book and I, you know. And mm. Well, so uh, so for example, Jay's journal is uh, is maybe the clearest example of this. So this was the book that she put out, came out in December 78, January 1979. And 
So her account actually, and this is, I'm just reading now from, this is actually from Jay's journal. And she, she writes the introduction as herself because it says, so it's um, the credit on this particular version, which is from 2003, I think. Um, I think this is the most recent version. The credit on the front is Jay's journal by anonymous. And then it says edited by Dr. Beatrice Sparks, who also discovered Go Ask Alice. And it's notable that it says who also discovered Go Ask Alice. That's an interesting credit. But the introduction to this book says, um, at 7 a.m. January 3rd, 1978, a very distressed mother phoned. She said she'd read an article about how I had prepared Go Ask Alice from an existing diary and how I hoped it would help educate young people as to the problems and pressures of the weaknesses of their peers to make it easier for them to consider alternatives and make wise decision in their own lives. And then she says, the lady said that her son, Jay, had kept a journal, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and that he died. And so, so that was in Jay's journal, her, her backstory was that, was that this mother had read about her editing Go Ask Alice. And then when, when the mother's son died, when her son Jay died, she found this diary and thought, ah, I should contact this woman who edited Go Ask Alice. And so yeah. that was her story. Yeah, that's what I meant with embed her voice yeah. because she writes as herself saying, uh, you know, I was contacted to write this book. So that's what I meant with embed. So I guess the question, the answer is a yes. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. And, and that's, and, and so for her later books, so she put out, in 1984, for example, she put out a book called It Happened to Nancy, which is, again, another teenage diary, and that she put out several of those, you know, for the, over the next decade, and her explanation was usually something, and she would say this in interviews, she did a lot of interviews, uh, you know, throughout the 80s and 90s, and a lot of, they all essentially took the same form that I either volunteered someplace and I worked with this teenager, or I counseled this teenager, or I knew this teenager's parents, um, and that this, the explanations sometimes shifted. They weren't always terribly consistent, but um, yeah, but she, she did always have a story. Were these parents real? Did you ever find out if these parents were real? Well, um, that would be, uh, that's another one of those, that's another one of those facets that did seem to shift on occasion. Uh, I'll put it that way. Uh, so for example, you know, her, her explanation as to how Go, uh, Go Ask Alice came to exist. On occasion, she would say that Alice, that the real Alice, on occasion, she would say, well, the real Alice uh, gave me her diaries for safekeeping because she didn't want her parents to find them. You know, that Alice didn't want her parents to know that she'd done drugs and done all these horrible things. And, and so she gave me the diaries for safekeeping. And then as luck would have it, she died shortly afterward. And I, I had these diaries. Um, in other interviews, she would say, well, I got these diaries from Go or I got these diaries from Alice's parents after Alice died. And so even the existence of the parents themselves seemed to seem to shift depending on on when she told the story. So as with many things, it's uh, it's a uh, it's a little bit of a uh, those a little bit of a shifting sand on those, you know, those stories are built on. Um. How did Sparks' family react to your book? Uh, well, I interviewed uh, her son, and um, she has, uh, so she had three children, um, one of whom, uh, uh, you know, died fairly young, and um, but she has three children, uh, two of whom, well, I, she has three children. I spoke with one of them. Um, one of the others declined to speak with me and I, uh, the other, the remaining child, I, uh, uh, or I say child, but they're grown now, but, um, uh, had one of her, her oldest daughter has, um, you know, has sort of withdrawn from public life because of some personal and health issues. And so once I learned that I took her off my interview list, uh, but I did speak with her son and, oh, it's, um, her, her son, Actually, early in our conversation, he opened by saying, um, he opened by saying, nobody knows her story, including me. And so that tells you a lot about, you know, about Beatrice Sparks and, you know, just a lot about the challenge of writing this book. And that even her son started by saying, you know, nobody knows much about her. And that includes, that includes her family. Um, he, uh, it's always tricky interviewing um, you know, 
children, you know, adult children, because people are inclined, no matter who, no matter, I, I don't want to say this absolutely, but I think in most cases, um, you know, no matter who your parents are or what your parents may have done, I think there's, I think there's just this inborn tendency to, um, there's this inborn tendency to, uh, you know, to defend them and to accent, you know, the best parts of their, of their personality and of their life. And so, you know, it's, I think, um, how do I put this? Um, you know, during the course of that conversation, uh, you know, his take on it sort of shifted even just during the time he and I talked that, and you know, he would sometimes say, well, he would say that she didn't do anything wrong. And, you know, but later that would sort of shift to, well, if she did do any of these things, she had only the best intentions. You know, it was, you know, she was, it was, she was for a greater good. Um, and, you know, so again, it's, it is a little bit tricky because, you know, because kids love their parents. Um, but, you know, that being said, um, you know, her kids are grown and they have their own lives at this point. And I don't know that they're terribly invested in, uh, you know, in what she did or did not do. But, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it is, uh, it's just another fascinating layer to the story. The fact that, the fact that even her family, you know, didn't seem to know a lot about her, that she was you know, deliberately opaque about those things. Um, I just think about me as a daughter when you're saying, yeah, we, we inevitably, inevitably are going to go towards our parents' side, our parents, whether, and maybe he did not know anything. Maybe that was the real truth. He didn't know I mean, it's, it's absolutely possible because it's, I, I will say that, you know, when he, when he opened by when he opened with that statement where he said, uh, you know, nobody knows her story, including me, you know, I don't think that's unique to Beatrice Sparks. I think that, you know, there's a lot of talk, I, you know, you hear a lot of people talk today about, about teenagers and, you know, people in the early 20s, and they'll talk about oversharing and say, well, this is an oversharing generation. I think to some degree, I think people who came of age in the Depression and around World War II, I think that was a little bit of an undersharing generation in the sense that I think people sometimes... I mean, I think certainly my grandparents were this way, where they just, I mean, my grandparents almost never talked about their own childhood or their own adolescence. They just didn't discuss it because I think that, I think to some degree that was, I think to some degree, you know, they just, they didn't, they just, uh, I think that for a lot of people, that was something that they, they had put behind them. It was an unpleasant time in their life. It was something that they were trying to get past. And I think if you came of age during certainly the Great Depression, and so you have, I mean, so you have World War One and a pandemic and the Great Depression, and then another world war. And it was just a tear. I mean, it, I mean, obviously, every time, as we've learned, has its own tumult and its own crises and so forth. But I do think for that generation in particular, there was this idea of we made it through two world wars and a great depression. And so now I don't, I just want to move on and I want to be somebody else and I want to have a new life and I don't want to think about any of that stuff. And also I'm probably not going to burden my children with it by talking about it. Uh, or I just don't even want to think about it for the rest of my life. And, um, you know, and, and also it was just a more, it was a more conservative time just in terms of what it was considered appropriate to discuss. Um, you know, and I think, I think now you know, if somebody goes through something that is, you know, unpleasant or horrific uh, as a as a teenager, you know, if somebody is exposed to, you know, abuse or, and I'm not saying that was the case with her, but I'm, as an example, if somebody now, you know, it's it is it is common now and and healthily so, but it is common now for people to talk about openly about things that they went through when they were growing up or things that they went through when they were younger. And there's a real openness and a willingness to discuss those things and to share, you know, unpleasant but personal things that happened to you in your formative years. I don't think it was that way, uh, you know, for, for a lot of older generations. I think, especially for the World War II generation, I think, you know, something like that happened to you, you kept it to yourself, you didn't talk about it. And so I, I think she was a little bit of a blank by design 
We have two questions here from Adam. The first one is, why was Spark's name taken out of the book? Out of? Yeah, out of um, the book. Oh, uh, from Gwaz Gallus. Um, pardon me. <coughs> like, I managed to swallow incorrectly. Um, I think one of the real, I mentioned at the top that, uh, you know, that book continues to sell and, you know, 51 years now after having come out, Goaz Gallus is still um, a book that sells a lot and it still has a lot of traction and a lot of currency with teenage readers, which is, which is not very common. I mean, you know, there's obviously books and, you know, and young adult books in particular that have a long lifespan. Goaz Gallus, though, really is one of the handful that continue to be insanely popular now. And it's, I think, to some degree, it's because there isn't an overt adult presence. Um, you know, I think it's the idea that, you know, there's, there are far few, there are, there are a few faster ways to turn uh, an adolescent off of something than to say, you know, grownups want you to read this, or, you know, uh, you know, grownups think, you know, an adult thinks that you should really read this. It's a good idea. It's a, you know, this book has things you should know. As soon as an adult tells you that something is going to be good for you, or they, or they, or even it's like, if you're, I mean, I, you know, this is true for a lot of people that I knew, and it was certainly true for me when I was growing up, like if my parents told me that something was good, if it was a, you know, a movie or a, you know, a song or a band or something, even if I eventually learned to like that thing, as soon as an adult told me something was awesome, my immediate assumption was that thing was terrible. You know, so it's like when an adult is like, hey, you should really check out this album by whoever. I was like, yeah, I'll do that. In the back of my head, I was like, I'm never listening to that because it can't be any good. How do I know? Because a grown up recommended it. And Go Ask Alice doesn't have any overt adult presence to it. Um, you know, obviously people know that books don't just drop out of the air. They come from somewhere. But you know, there's no adult presence to get in the way or to distract you as far as, you know, when you, the experience of that book is the same now as it was then. It is just you and this girl writing a diary and she's talking to you with no filter and no, no adult in the way. Um, and Adam's other question, and I hope this answered uh, Adam's first question. Uh, he asks, Sparks died in 2012, three years before you started working on the book. What would you have liked to have her ask her if given the opportunity? Well, uh, so the two threads, I mean, there are more than two threads in this, in this story, but you know, the two main literary threads in this story are Go Ask Alice and then this, this second diary, Jay's Journal, that came out um, in, you know, at the beginning of 79. And... You know, I mentioned earlier that Al Go Ask Alice is, you know, thoughts have gone back and forth about whether it's true or not, and that the, you know, the answer, as I found out, is, is not quite so simple either way. Um, Jay's journal, there is undeniably, there is indisputably a real life person at the core, you know, behind that book. I mean, in, in Jay's journal, there are absolutely, there's a, there's a real life person that that book is based on, and, but the book and the real life person are, how do I, I to put it mildly, they are, um, they're quite different. There were um, significant, is a paltry word to describe this, but there are significant embellishments and liberties taken with a real life person in creating the book, Jay's Journal. And it's sometimes hard to tell if, if it's sometimes hard to tell what prompted those changes. In other words, was it, um, you know, was it because she was trying to tell a better story? Was it because there was some, uh, some moral or some lesson she was trying to convey? And so she thought, well, you know, it's the end justifies the means. If I embellish this, or if I, you know, if I take this real life person and these real life diary entries, and I add these other things to it, it's okay in the end because A, he's dead, and B, if it helps one person, that was the thing that actually her son said. You know, he said that he started off by kind of dismissing the idea that she would, you know, that she would, uh, you know, augment or, or, you know, or change or, or, you know, be deceptive in any of these books. At another point, I, you know, he did say something to the effect of, well, if she did that, it was, you know, it was only, it was only with the best intentions, essentially, you know, if she did that, it was because she wanted to help young people by, by giving them this cautionary tale. 
you know, maybe that's true. Maybe not. Uh, you know, maybe, you know, maybe she was just indifferent, you know, maybe she just didn't care. And it's sometimes hard to get a fix on that. So um, knowing her motives with a little more specificity would, would have been nice. Okay. I guess we'll never know. I, well, it's, and I, there are, there is, and I, I'm, and I'm actually not trying to, I, 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 want to make sure I'm not deliberately, I'm not trying to sound deliberately opaque when I say that, because it's, you know, there are, I don't want to make it sound as though there's just nothing known about her or the backstory or the process or how things were changed or what things were changed, because I absolutely did learn a lot of that stuff. Um, it's, and I do, you know, to, to the extent that I was able, I do lay out what happened and what seems to be the motivation behind a lot of that. And you know, one thing I will say is that, you know, she, um, you know, she did, uh, you know, she did keep a lot of records, but she also, she corresponded with a lot of people uh, over the years. She gave a lot of interviews and I did get also incredibly lucky at a couple of points in my research where I, I mean, I, I, I mean, some of this was like one part research and like five parts blind luck because there were moments where there were a couple of points where I happened to find somebody or talk to somebody who ended up having some vast amount of material that ended up being incredibly useful. Like sometimes I, at one point, uh, I talk about this in the author's note at the end, but at one point I ended up getting in touch with somebody who actually just had this huge box full of stuff in their garage that they hadn't thought about for 30 years. And they were like, well, let me go check this box in the garage to see if I, and then it turns out they just had all of this stuff that was unbelievably useful and it was like real like in the moment contemporaneous like firsthand accounts of things and they're like I don't even know why I saved this and I was like I don't either but I'm glad you did so I I learned a lot of that stuff um uh but you know at the same time it is worth noting that a phrase I've, I probably have started to use too much is that Beatrice Sparks was not just the unreliable narrator of other people's lives she was to some degree, the unreliable narrator of her own life. And, you know, that makes research kind of tricky, you know, because you can never really take anything at face value. You know, everything has to be, everything has to be poked and prodded to try to figure out whether it's accurate or not. And so why do you think people are so drawn to the novels, even though they know it's fake? Um, I think in the case of, you know, in the case of Gomez Canales, I do think it is because um, it's because that book does really, you know, I, again, I always feel like I have to note this, that it's been a long, long time since I was a teenager. So I, I, I don't want to be some other, you know, like 50 year old guy going like, let me tell you how young people think. Cause I, you know, I, I don't know what it's like to be a young person today, but I will say that I think, you know, I think there's, I think there's certain dynamics about being an adolescent and the way that, you know, and your interactions with, with society and with grownups and, you know, and just, and, you know, it's it, like being a teenager is just this, I mean, I would never want to be, you could not pay me enough to be a teenager again, ever, ever, ever. There was just no amount of money that would make it worthwhile because it, yeah, I mean, being a teenager is sort of a, it's kind of a magical, glorious time. And it's also just the worst time in your life because, and for all the same reasons, because it's like, you're getting, because you're being treated to some degree like an adult, but only when you don't want to be, you know, and you're being treated like a child but only when you don't want to be. So, you know, when you, you know, when you, when you are 15, 16, 17, you start being handed a lot of adult responsibilities and a lot of potential adult punishments. And yet you're not really getting a lot of the adult freedom. You're still, you're, cause you're not an adult. You're still not an adult. You still can't vote. You still can't do a lot of things that adults can do. And yet there's a lot of places where they're more than happy to put you on trial as an adult, where they're more than happy, you know, to control every aspect of your life and existence, even as they deny you the legal protections that come with being an adult. And maybe there are good reasons for that. Maybe there aren't, but it's still frustrating as hell when you're a teenager. And it's just this time when you can, you know, because it's, because childhood is still close enough that you can see it in your rear view mirror. And you might even have like a little bit of preemptive nostalgia for it. And yet, um, you know, adulthood is, 
on the horizon and you can see adulthood but you can't quite reach it or touch you know touch it yet it's still too far away and so it's a it's a really high energy high drama kind of fantastic awful period of your life and it's hard to really get that right i think especially in especially in in uh you know on the printed page and especially if i mean you know the number of adults who can who can write a book that effectively talks to and with as opposed to at teenagers is or children is vanishingly small i mean there's a reason why people like judy bloom continue to be i mean they're perennial bestsellers i mean because you know judy bloom was i think 40 when she wrote when she published are you there god it's me margaret which came out in 1970 so the year before go ask alice that's another book that just continues to sell to young people because she had judy bloom had and has this little bit of magic where she can she can capture what it's like she remembers what it's like and and go ask alice especially does the same thing and yeah you know, and if you read Go Ask Alice and it clicks with you and it, it really resonates with you, and then you see another book later that says, from the person who brought you Go Ask Alice, you're going to give that book a chance. And if that book is even half as good, you're going to give the next book that says, from the person who brought you Go Ask Alice a chance. And it becomes sort of a self-replicating thing. But, um, you know, but that book is, uh, it's lightning in, in a bottle, definitely. Do you think the books are good? Like, do you think Beatrice Sparks did a good job as editor, author? Um, uh, I mean, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm creating bad karma if I, if I, if I try to, if I criticize anybody else's writing, I feel like I'm not in a position to do that. But I will say that, um, I will say that I think there is a reason, I, I think that I think a lot of artists of in, in any field, like, you know, I think it's, this happens with musicians a lot. This happens with filmmakers a lot where you have this one success, this one thing that is, that really works and really clicks and you just, you know, and it's a huge hit. And then you kind of try to do that thing again. And it maybe works like a little, a little less well the second time and a little less well the second time after that. And a lot of times people fall into this trap of just trying to recreate this one thing that was a success and they can't figure out why the first one worked and the second one doesn't work when they're trying to do the same thing. Um, I think Go Ask Alice to some degree works in spite of itself is what I'm saying, that it's it it should not be as effective as it is. I think one of the reasons that Go Ask Alice is so effective is that it's good in the sense I guess I'm, I guess I'm taking, I, I really am taking way too long to answer this. What I could say is that, you know, in terms of pure, in terms of pure objective, you know, formal assessment, it's not that good. Uh, but, but as a book that is presumably the diary of a drug addled 15, 16, 17 year old girl, it reads really well because I, for, I don't know what a 16-year-old speed-addled Christian is supposed to sound like, but it seems like it might sound a lot like the girl in Go Ask Alice. And uh, actually, and another thing, you know, about that book in particular, I think another secret to Alice's ongoing success is that it is so fast-paced and propulsive. It does not read like a book that was written more than 50 years ago. Um, you know, for one thing, in Go Ask Alice, there are no chapters. There's no, I mean, because it, it's a diary, and so sometimes there are dates, but sometimes there aren't dates. There's no chapter breaks. There's no part one, part two. It's just this chain of entries, and it just goes from one to the other, and some of the entries are a few pages long. Some of the entries are like only a paragraph, and it's just this, and so there's there's never a point where you're like, well, I'll stop after this chapter, because there are no chapters. It's just this fire hose that comes at you, and so it almost, it's almost impossible for that book to get dated in some ways because a it was already set i mean even when it came out it was already presumably dated because the girl had already ostensibly been dead for a couple of years anybody who picks it up now knows that it happened 50 years ago so it's almost future proofed and because it's written in such a hyper kinetic fast cut style um it doesn't feel slow and sluggish the way a lot of books from that era do i mean it really feels it I, I mean this probably is a cliche but it it almost feels like something written by you know it for the internet age it just feels like a lot of really really first draft ultra fast 
you know, cuts. So I think that's one of the reasons why it works. It's, you know, it's not good, but it's somehow great. So we're going to end with Adam's question. Um, do you think it's specifically shocked people because she was a 15 year old Christian white girl from the middle class suburbs? Absolutely. I mean, that was absolutely a huge part of why um, that book resonated, you know, in a way that, you know, disproportionate to, to what it, it seems like would have happened. I mean, I don't, I, I, for example, like Prentice Hall, for example, when that, you know, when, when, uh, when Go Ask Alice first came out in September of 71, um, you know, they immediately ran out of, ran out of stock because they'd not printed nearly enough. Um, I'm doing this from memory, so I might get it wrong, but um, I think the initial print run uh, for Go Ask Alice was, I mean, I think it was 5,000 copies, I think. Um, it wouldn't, wasn't any more than that. And before that book even came out, the week before Go Ask Alice came out, it had already had 18,000 pre-orders. And so, I mean, it was, and, and then it just exploded from the, and it, you know, and there was a long period of time where you couldn't get the book anywhere because it was, they couldn't print them fast enough. It was constantly sold out everywhere. And, but then none of the things in, I mean, it's not like any of those social ills, you know, were necessary. You know, were new. Drugs weren't a new problem. Runaways weren't a new problem. Um, you know, sexual abuse was obviously not a new problem. Um, but there were a lot of cultural shifts happening, especially in the wake of the 1960s, to where, you know, to. I mean, one hates to generalize, but I will do it nonetheless. You know, to the average, you know, to to the average just suburban white family. You know, it's like these are problems that happen someplace else and to, you know, other kids and to other types of people. And it was this idea that, you know, this, I, this idea that things that, you know, good children in good neighborhoods, and we obviously all know what that's code for, uh, you know, problems that people thought that they would be exempt from. I mean, that was this, that was one of the fantasies of, uh, you know, of this, uh, you know, this flight to the suburbs, the idea that we're, well, we're going to leave, we're going to leave the city where there's all these big city, or as they sometimes said, all these inner city problems, and inner city is its own kind of code word, and we're going to go to the suburb, uh, suburb, and people, you know, obviously still, hear, and I'm not, I'm not trying to say that everybody who flees to the suburbs is necessarily thinking this, but we do still hear that language today. People say, well, like, I'm going to go to the suburbs because it's a good, safe place to raise a family. And sometimes that just means what it means. And sometimes that means something, you know, a little bit, you know, a little bit more insidious. And a lot of the early advertising for Go Ask Alice, in fact, uh, I have somewhere out here, I printed out somewhere, I have a newspaper ad that Prentice Hall took out when that book first came out. And I believe the, the first line of this full page newspaper ad at the first line, it says, Alice is 15. Let's see. Alice is 15 white and from a good Christian home. And I mean, that was the first thing in the ad. And that was not a, that was not an anomaly. I mean, a lot of the advertising absolutely hit those points, you know, that she's a, you know, she's a good girl from a Christian home. And did we mention that she's white? And so that kind of unsubtle, um, you know, sort of, you know, messaging and advertising was absolutely a huge part of why that book became so much a part of the national conversation. Well, Rick, thank you so much for answering all of our questions. Thank you so um, much for having me. When and where can people find the book? Uh, so this book is coming out on Tuesday, July 5th. Uh, it was originally supposed to be earlier, but of course, say it all together now, supply chain issues. Uh, so Tuesday, July 5th, uh, you can get that wherever, wherever, wherever you purchase books. Uh, it's going to be uh, ebook form and hardcover and audiobook uh, all on Tuesday, July 5th. Did you record the audiobook? I did not actually, uh, oh. which, which is sort of surprising to people. And yeah. I know that it, well, because, and so, and, and so I, I spent most of my, or a lot of, a lot of my life in radio. And, um, and so I, I think there was this expectation. I sort of had toy, you know, it was an expectation among, I, certainly my friends were like, you're going to read the audiobook, right? And I was like, eh, probably not. Because there's two reasons for that. One is that it's a, uh, it's a really, uh, you know, it's a very, it's a very strongly female story in a lot of ways. I mean, there are a lot of characters, but Beatrice Sparks is to some degree the through line. And there's a lot of, you know, really strong, prominent female characters in the book. But at, 
honestly, and, and if there's also another reason, which, you know, is, is at least, you know, it was at least as influential, which is that because I did spend so long doing broadcasting and radio and I've done narration and voice work, I thought, okay, well, if I do this and I do a good job, it's not like, I mean, I mean, that's not, you know, I won't get any credit for that because it'll just be like as expected. People are like, well, of course he did a good job. He was worked in a radio and he wrote this. So it's like, I'm not going to get any credit if I do it well, but if I do it badly, if I screw it up, it's like, then I have to move. Then I have to just, then I have to pack everything and move to Alaska and never come back or whatever. I have to move to, to Mars. So, <laughs> so just fear of abject failure. <laughs> well, for the people that want to listen to another voice that is not yours or uh, just read it. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and I should say, actually, I, I'm glad you said that. This is a, a good opportunity. I, I should have said this earlier. Uh, so it was voiced by uh, a very talented um, uh, woman named Gabra Zachman, who has done a lot of audiobooks, and she's just a great voice talent. And um, and so, yeah, it's the unabridged version, and that'll be uh, wherever, wherever audiobooks are sold uh, on July 5th. Well, uh, we're all going to go out and read it and we'll buy it and then read it. Excellent. So thank you for your time. And, you know, thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. And thank you to everybody that joined us. And if you're watching afterwards on YouTube, uh, thank you so much. <laughs>